Do you have a card? August Falter off with Q and A and the Misa show. So welcome all to this month's Q and A. And as per usual, it's myself, Shuan, and Emma. Can you to Emma? Chris Ta. Come on, Gamash, Shuan. Chris Ta, too fine. Come on, come on, guys. Come on, what? Into her fad. Marshin, cut him into two slash. So, uh, let's get started. Um. So, our first question here is from Fraser in Edinburgh. And his question is, hi both, I'm struggling to understand the difference in the use of faig, faig or faig, and yoi or yoig, and there's a few other pronunci different pronunciations of all sorts of words. Are there easy rules around this or are any other advice you can give? So, Good amah, good Fraser. Thanks very much for your uh, for your um, question there. So, um, the answer there I would give to that would be there's I'd say three answers really. And as the verb phi, of which both phi and yo we are a part of, is an irregular verb. Different forms of the verb resemble either fai or yoi. So, for example, when saying someone will get something, you can say yoi she, he'll get it, yoi she. But when you're saying he will not get it, it's ni wi she, ni wi she. So it's just a variation there um, of d depending on if it's negative or positive in that case. And also, if you look at the verb, Fai, which is F A I G H, which is the verb to get, you will see that it varies a lot in the past tense or present tense or anything like that. So just to, to keep an eye out for that. So the, the second, then you could say, the second way these are used is that phi is used in an indirect relative clause. And yoi is used in a direct relative clause. So if you're confused by what that means, don't worry for now, I'll explain it a bit. So for example, I'll give you two sentences here. One is relative, direct, I should say, direct. This one is direct. Unfair, a yoey, and post, the man who'll get the job. However, the indirect one is unfair, a we, a walk, and post, the man whose son will get the job. So as you can see, the first one, we're talking about a man getting a job. It's quite straightforward. Whereas in the second one, and fair are we, a walk a post. It's a bit more complicated. There's a few, there's two characters here. Uh, so even in English, you would say the man who will get the job, but, in it, but the man whose son. So it changes in English, of course, as well. So it's similar to that. And then the third reason you could have either of these words is um, when it's a conjunction and an example of that would be Ta isagum gui me an litcher in you I know I'll get or receive the letter today so I I know that I'll get it or I know I'll get it a bit similar to how you can say that in, in English but the, um, when it's not a conjunction, you would have a simple um, sentence like this. I will get the letter today. You a man letter in you. So as you can see, the five one is used when there's more involved. And it's not a very straightforward question. Like you're not getting something. Someone else is getting something belonging to you or something like that. Something a bit more complicated. Or... Um, um, you know that you'll get something or there's a bit more involved in simply getting something um so as you can see so there's a few more elements involved so that's the idea there so what you should do is um look up um to, to find out more about this either google it or look up in a grammar book the relative clause and you'll see that it that this pertains to more than just the verb fi or fig to get 
um, you'll see that that's the um, difference between a wheel and a tow, for example, it's, it's similar. And um, also conjunctions, have a look at conjunctions as well, and you'll find out loads about this. Um, and and we'll end with Laurel, good for you, Emma. No, Vishashin Gahun Tok Shawan, um, really well explained. Uh, Faig, that verb can be difficult for people in general because it is one of the irregular verbs. Um, so there's definitely more to it than just, you know, um, Faig and Yoig. So, but you explained it very well. And I'd say the relative clause there can catch people out in a lot of in a lot of verbs, not just with Faig. So don't be too worried if you are getting a bit stuck on it. Um, just practice practice and I'm going to read through and look at it that way um yeah mahu well done go um on Jean uh, so the next question is from Jean in the state of Illinois in the USA and her question is looking for a word meaning sailplane or glider and a phrase let's go soaring Thank you so much. I'm slowly learning, but so enjoying it. Ainte kafajin goramagat. That's wonderful to hear. And will Ian rag rag shin Emma? Kinta, yeah. So to be honest with you, um, a glider or a sailplane wouldn't be one that I'd often use. So I did have to check it um, for you. Um, and fui lord is what I found. Um, now Siobhan, is feather lots of. Chak the shaka because for the ignella or almost feather. Um, but fui lower would be the one that I found and the most commonly used one. And for your little phrase then of let's go soaring, there's a couple of ways you could say it. You could say tamish egg fui lowrucht, or you could say arigling egg fui lowrucht. So egg fui lowrucht would be soaring. So that egg there in the front would be the equivalent to the English ing, so soaring. Fuilo egg fuilo rot, and eridling would be, you could translate it, I suppose, to English like off with us, off with us soaring. So let's go soaring, or tamish egg fuilo rot, which would then come from the verb teig, which would be to go. So they would be my suggestions. Now I used folklore.ie or folklore.ie um, to kind of double check the the terms there and they gave some examples so if you are looking for a specific term especially in English uh, folklore.ie is quite good and it gives nice examples to go with them so I agree there that sounds right and even the word reminds me of the word um, or fuilion fuilion because yeah. Fuilion is a, a seagull, and the fuilion, I think of that as like a flag fluttering sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, something like that. So it, it it does convey that meaning of gliding. So mm -hmm. fuilior, then that ending like fermior, farmer. So it's something that glides. Um, mm -hmm. So fuilior. Gan what? Gahuntoch. So I suppose I'll read the next question. And this question comes in from Sean in Naples in Florida in the USA, uh, not Naples in Italy, in Florida. So uh, the question is, <clears throat> I imagine that some languages are more forgiving and intelligible with improperly formed grammar or syntax. For example, if someone said, I yesterday ate, eat chicken, you would know that they meant I ate chicken yesterday while others are more like a computer programming language where slight errors can render a sentence unintelligible or dramatically change its meaning. Where would you put Irish on that spectrum? So first of all, Gurmila Mahagat, Sean, Astakesh. So thank you, Sean, for your question. An interesting one, and one that I think that myself and Siobhan might discuss here, but I'll, I'll pass the mic to you, Siobhan. Where would you put Irish in that kind of spectrum, even if you can, or could you? Um, so that's a very good question there, and I suppose it's one that's really up for discussion and not the easiest answer, I think, um, in many ways, because I think some people might have a different perspective on this. So I'd say 
it's somewhere somewhat in the middle and i don't think but i suppose it is a bit more forgiving um but it's not one of those languages where you can just throw words in anywhere either so there is both elements it's not um it's it's not a terribly strict language though you can word sentences in different ways and if you do words them differently they have a different meaning and when you think of it i'm not sure but i don't think it's dramatically different from um from english in that respect mm. because if you word things a bit differently in english you sometimes you'll have a very drastically different sentence whereas other times um it doesn't make much difference at all and um so it and and so i'd say even idioms in english um can um, can can mean can, can be like this as well. There's ones that come to mind a bit like um, to get your money's worth and stuff like that. Whereas um, can mean a bit, you know. Th there's just so certain ones that I can't think of the other one I'm thinking of, mm. which get which learners of course would easily um, mix up in English. But it's similar, and there's loads of things that you know change them a bit and have a different sentence. But then, no. Um, I suppose one thing that might be a little unforgiving in Irish is the um, the prepositions. Uh, for example, after um, a word. So I can't actually think of an example, but sometimes. Uh, so that, oh yeah, it's um, it's a bit like if you were to say. Um, Tahata orum, tahata agum, but again, that's a bit similar to English. There's a yeah. hat on me. I have a hat. Like it, it means different things. But there are some ones that are not as, I think, not as recognisable as that in Irish as well, where the where the prepositions it can be just a subtle change, a little small little word, but um, it can't air, it can't le, it can't le, talking to someone, it can't le dinna, it can't air, it can't fui, talking about someone. So again, it's not that different from English either in that respect. Obviously, it makes a big difference if you're talking about someone or with someone or to someone. There's a big difference. Uh, so mm -hmm. what do you think about that, Emma? Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's it's hard to kind of put it on a spectrum. The only thing that popped to mind when I thought about it is the, is word order in Irish is different to English and a, a different to a lot of languages. And that's, it's verb, it's a verb subject object language or a VSO language. So your verb should always come first. So um, using, using that um, sentence that you had Sean, I ate chicken yesterday, you'd have to have eight at the start. So di me chicken in a. Now, you could technically, you know, it's quite strict in that way that you should, you should put um, the verb first. You could say in a di me shikin. It grammatically it would be incorrect, um, you know, but you could say it, but it wouldn't be terribly amazing Irish if you know if you were to write it out. You would probably if you were in a class, you'd be say you'd be told to put the. Um, DNA or the yesterday at the end of the sentence, but I'd still understand you if you said in a did me shikin because maybe as some of you might know or some of you might don't I don't I am um, I live in Germany and I I talk to German speakers a lot and even when they speak English to me, um, the time often comes first in German. So yesterday I went to the shop, whereas you know I went to the shop yesterday. Who I make a deal shop in a so. It's it can be done. It's not going to change, you know, the understanding terribly. But um, if you want to be really, you know, on point with your grammar, you should follow your verb, subject, object. Um, it'll change in certain in certain instances. But no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that Irish. If you get one little word wrong or you put it in the wrong place, that we won't have a clue what you're saying. Um, but I think when you start learning Irish and you see the, the sentence structure, you get more, you get used to it and you kind of follow and you think in that way as well, um, the way the genitive works and things like that. But no, I wouldn't say it's amazing or terribly unforgiving, but I wouldn't say it's the most 
easy language to just put any words together or throw them in anywhere as Joanne said earlier on. So in the middle, I don't know would that satisfy your 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 question, uh, Sean, but that's um that's our take on it. If anyone else in the comments after this video even or on the blog post wants to post more on that, you are always welcome. Um, I'd also like to add there as well the idea of like people often wonder about the shavel, uh, for example. And most of the time, if you leave that out, the lenition, that little H after a consonant, if you leave that out often, people still understand you. The only real time you need to be very careful is, with that is when you're talking about position. A cat, one is her cat, the other is his cat. A got their cat, for example. So in that case, it's quite unforgiving. But usually, if you say mokat instead of mokat, mokat is the correct one. If you say mokat, everyone will still understand it. It just sounds a bit wrong. Um, so it, it it definitely isn't the strictest if you don't follow the grammar correctly. Um, let's move on to the next question. Um Marshin and Kid Kishtella oh um or Mark is Seattle. I would like to integrate more Irish into my writing beyond Girit and Gormagat, but how can I be certain that the Irish I include is grammatically correct? I don't want to accidentally add something to my work that would sound ridiculous or wrong to native and fluent speakers. An kist, mark gomaragat, an will ein ragragat foshin anis Emma. Ta ta. Um, so first, yeah, gomaragat as an kist shin mark, and you're probably not the only one, and that wants to you know integrate a bit more than hello and thank you. First of all, I'd say don't be worried about sounding ridiculous or silly or anything like that in front of native or fluent speakers. Most, if not all of them, wouldn't shame you for any type of mistakes that you might make. So, you know, never be afraid to make mistakes. But of course, you want to get it right. And everyone does. Everyone wants, you know, to start off as they mean to or start as they mean to go on. So what I would say is for yourself, depending on how much you want to learn or what you want to say or what you want to add, I'd say first start off by, and a little plug here, by looking through our own YouTube channel. So Bite Size Irish's YouTube channel. Um, Siobhan has done, I can't even count how many videos Siobhan has done on how to say little phrases, words, and they're useful. They're common, you know. So I would say have a look through those. They're available on the YouTube um, channel here that this live is will be, you know, uploaded afterwards. And on the blog post or on the blog page as well on our website, bitesize.irish. So have a look through those and the blog posts in general, because there is a lot that goes with those as, as well as uh, audio and pronunciation guides. So if you did come to you having to say it in person, you'd also have that. But since you want to say it in writing, you could also go on, as I mentioned before, folklore.ie or folklore.ie, uh, which is an English Irish dictionary or chongman.ie. And folklore would probably suit you better because you want to maybe search from an English term and get it in Irish. Search it up. They have many 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 example phrases and they're put into context as well for you and that's important you know you're not just getting the word more often than not you scroll down and there could be two pages of just that word or that phrase used in context and I think that's very valuable because you can see where it sits in the um in the sentence and in a conversation and you're a bit clearer on how to use it so that would be my suggestion um you could also if you are haven't already have a look at our taster course on bite size you know we start off with the basics of irish and a little bit of grammar and if you have an understanding of the grammar you know your basics you might not be as you know afraid or unsure you might be a bit more confident in using your phrases that you might want to use. So our taster course will be linked in the description of this video and uh, gives you gives you a little taste or a little bite of what we have in our bite size course C, so our courses um, in Irish. And we definitely start off with some basics there for you. Um, 
But yeah, that would be my corla or my advice. Siobhan on Valine Rod Ella Um Shinan Corla, that's great advice there. Um, but that's basically I would say that the, the basically the story here is to be sure of what you're what you're writing you have to know the language you have to acquire the language really there's no magic way um like obviously people can use google translate but it's not great there's no we real way the only other way would be and if you write something out and you have a fluent speaker who can who can um correct it for you and explain the errors but really learning through bites Size Irish, stuff like that. That's the only real way you'll you'll know how how everything is correct. Because when you think of it, there are so many elements to a language, and you have to learn each element. And there's just so many. If you if you think of just even one sentence in English, there's just so many elements to that sentence. And if you're a native speaker, that just comes second nature. But it takes so much time to pick up any language. Um, for some people, quicker than others. But that's really the only thing. That's the only way to to you know to, to to have a foolproof way of finding out. But as as um, Emma recommended, there folklore.ie is great because there's loads of uh, sample sentences, so you can see how sentences would generally be structured. And if you're if you have a sentence and you're not so sure if you're approaching it in the correct way you mightn't be able to find the exact same sentence on the internet of course but you might be you might think of maybe replacing replacing this sentence with um a more common verb let's say or a more common word and maybe you'll find a very similar sentence or even just by searching one of the words on let's say folklore you might come across a sentence that's similar enough to the type of sentence you want to write so that's one way around it but there is that takes a bit of time to even get used to looking things up in that manner um even if, for example again going back to english if you have a if you were thinking of wording a, a sentence a particular way and you're not exactly sure if it's correct what would you do you'd probably google it and you can do that in Irish as well. You just have to be very careful that it comes from a reputable site because there are so many um, results that come um, when you search, let's say, a sentence in Irish on Google. They're just Google translated web scam websites or something. So um, uh, that, that's the thing. So it just it has to come from a reputable website. So just be careful of that if you Google a, a, a sentence not just because it's in the Google results is it correct. So um, there's a, so I'd say to, to play around with that a bit, see what you can do. And um, that can help you a lot uh, with, with um, clarifying sentence structure. But of course, there's nothing like an actual human and learning grammar and just learning the language over time. It's, as I said, I don't think there's any silver bullet. Mm. Okay, Shane, Marcin, um, uh, so let's move on to the next question. So the next question is from Matthew Imankan Hasna. Uh, so Matthew is in Manchester, Sasna. Is there a public service requirement for television and radio companies in Ireland that mandates that a certain percentage of their output must be in Irish? If not, would it be a sensible step forward? Even if people alleged it was only tokenism, I think it would be a good symbolic gesture if all programmes used Irish greetings at the start and end of them, as well um, as well-known or easy-to-learn pleasantries within the programmes themselves. If not a panacea, but it's not a panacea, but it's a start, if nothing else. Also, it would be a positive, I think, if short set piece programmes like the weather were in Irish with the English version, the exception, say once or twice a day. Has there been any cause for similar requirements? If so, how have these been met by the populace at large in Ireland? Go to Mahaga, that's the case. Watch you. Keen Rank, Ritag, it's Emma. 
Very interesting question, Matthew Sogar Mahogut. Um, I did a bit of research um, on top of what I just my my small comment. I don't know if there's a quota. I couldn't find if there was a quota for non non Irish language. So for, we have uh, TG Cahar and uh, Radio Nagail uh, They are they are Irish language broadcasters. So take those out for a minute um, for the the normal English ones for everyone else. Yeah. Um, I do know that the greetings are often on the news in Irish on RTE. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I have heard it as well on um, the weather. But I did a little bit of research. So there was a recent article published this year uh, in March 2021 in the Irish Times. And they gave some good figures um, from a report on research on the use of the Irish language on radio. So this was just for radio. And there was a quote there from uh, Dr. John Walsh, who was is a senior senior lecturer at the School of Languages at NUIG. And he was actually the author of the report as well. So he says, once stations broadcasting in Irish are removed from the equation, being TG Cahar or, or, or Radio Nagel or um, Radio Nilifa and all those, the overall provision of radio programming in Irish is minimal at approximately 2% of overall output. So there's an interesting one. Uh, with the exception of RTE Radio na Gaeltachta, the total weekly output of Irish language programming on RTE Radio is six hours and eight minutes. This represents an increase from four hours and 15 minutes since the previous survey was carried out in 2018. So that's your, your usual RTE English standard radio not including the Radio and the Gaeltachta or the Irish language section. Now, there was another piece then on it that they said, I radio, uh, a regional radio station broadcasting to the Northwest, Midlands and Northeast reported the highest level of Irish language programming of any participating station, a total of 36 hours and 30 minutes per week. Now, we'll I'll uh, link the that piece or that um article in the blog post after this but there was another one then that I found um, which was even more interesting and it was a report published in February of this year by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland or the BAI and it was actually its first Irish language data collection report so the timing of this question, question um, is impeccable if you'd asked us last year I wouldn't have had this for you and uh, this project from the BAI is one of several initiatives arising out of the BAI Irish Language Action Plan, which was launched in 2019, uh, which aims to promote and stimulate the development of Irish language programming and broadcasting services in the I Irish audiovisual industry. OK, that's a mouthful. So just a couple of figures, not too many. There's more in the report, but I just took the most interesting ones. So they did an analysis over seven, a seven day period, namely the, between the 7th and the 13th of October 2019. And a total of 718.93 hours of Irish or slash bilingual programming was broadcast, comprising of 1,075 programs. Of the total minutage, radio accounted for 87% and TV was just 13%. Of the 1,075 programs, 736 or 68% were broadcast on radio and 339 were broadcast on televisions. Uh, of the 1,075 programmes, 854 were Irish, so that's 79%, and 221 or 21% were bilingual. So that might give you an idea of what's going on. Um, as far as I know, that's Irish language, um, TV and radio included in those figures. This is overall. Um, as I said, I link this in um, the, well, I'll get you on to link it in at the end uh, with the, in the, the blog post. And you can have a, a read into it because it's quite an interesting uh, article. I didn't want to bombard you with figures, but it's, it's quite um, good that there's some sort of initiative pushing um, for more Irish language broadcasting audio and visual whatever I don't know myself if there is any quota at the moment I know there is maybe in TG Cahar um but I'm I'm not 100% sure on if you have anything to add there um a right lot well I suppose uh, I just um thought I was just thinking there of how some broadcasters uh, do use more Irish than others 
Now, certain broadcasters on, for example, Lira FM, which is the classical music uh, radio station, some of them would um, now and then use full on sentences in Irish and they do have the news in Irish. So I'm not sure how many times a day, but occasionally you will hear the news come on in Irish. And um, you have that uh, in a, on a good few um, radio stations. You have certain broadcasters who will say goodbye in Irish, um, who will finish up the programme in Irish. And so it really depends. It re- I'd, I'd say it mostly depends on the broadcaster. But <clears throat> even with local radio stations, I do find that they would have a weekly programme, maybe an hour or two. <clears throat> Usually... Um, a maybe an Irish music traditional Irish music program as well, where the presenter speaks Irish completely throughout the program. Uh, so that's that would that happens, and um, so again it depends. But it's it's common enough for for broadcasters to what what you were suggesting there, um, and um, that they just sprinkle in some phrases or sentences and stuff like that. So that's not. Too uncommon at all. Marshin. Um Okay. Go to Mahakate Mas na figure you guys got it on the Sar Haija. That's great research there. I had I enjoyed actually, I enjoyed reading um about it because it is an interesting one to see um where it stands and you know um but again I don't listen to, to a lot of different Irish language radios. I'm abroad, so I'm kind of in a mixture here. So, um, Sean, your your experience is valuable as well here in the in the real time rather than just reading figures online. Um, okay, so there's an interesting question there in the chat um, from Daniel. So Daniel is one of our GROW members, and Daniel asks a good question as you always do, Daniel, and I'm always happy to answer them because um, you're definitely not the only one asking or thinking this. So he says, I'm not sure whether this is at all related. It is. Uh, But would would one sound unnatural in Irish if one were to use elements of all three dialects in one speech? So Daniel, of course, you would not sound unnatural did i word that correctly of course you can use more than one dialect you absolutely can Uh, you meet a lot of people and depending where they're from in the country they could say well i have a mixture even siobhan orenta you say Mm. that you have a mixture you have a mixture of you know you use certain ones um for many different reasons it could be as an irish person maybe you lived one place for a certain amount of years and in another place for another amount of years you might have had a couple of different teachers from different areas or that spoke different dialects so you picked up on different words as i know daniel you're a learner and you might just use the words that sound the nicest to you you might have no attachment to you know the fact that they're connacht and you're only learning connacht and you have to use no you might like what they say in ulster for the word i don't know dog or how they say how are you um it's totally up to you and it wouldn't sound unnatural whatsoever plenty of irish people have a mixture of dialects it all is down to um how you use it so for sure Siobhan Caddy Captain too because you definitely have you've said before that you have a mixture I agree and I've, I've even heard the most native of native speakers uh, using words from dialects that wouldn't be their own because sometimes a dialect has a word that's just and no other no other dialect has the word that does that does, that does the concept as much justice as that particular word and um so you you get that as well and people do like the phrases and that's it i have a mixture in irish i have a mixture in english some people you know it depends on where they've been and everything when you think of it even again i know i'm reverting back again to to using english as an example but i think that's what most people are aware of so it's easier to compare but um if you had someone who's let's say irish they lived in scotland and then they lived for a few years in new york their accent probably has little tinges of each of those dialects and they probably have picked up phrases and words f- um, from those areas that they just they find brilliantly describe some specific thing or they just have the habit of saying something now that they might never have said before so it's um 
it's it's perfectly natural it's perfectly natural so um that's it um in the mm-hmm. um, um okay so we'll go on to the next question then um from herbert in virginia in the usa and the question is some people say irish is a very poetic language how is it poetic and is it more poetic than other languages so we're trying to do another we're doing another scale here or another spectrum um which i'm sure me and siobhan will discuss again and come up with some examples uh siobhan can you happen to that um I'm Kish. It's a very good question and something I often hear. And whenever I hear it said about Irish or any language, to be honest, I just think of it as it being a nice compliment for a language. I never think of it as having much, much more of a deeper meaning. Um, I guess every language is poetic. It might be more poetic to some people's ears than the other, than another language, because poetry, even some people love one specific type of poetry than another. Um, it's really, I suppose, people are referring to the rhythm of the language, to the different sounds. And I think that's really all that it means. I don't think Irish is more poetic or less poetic than other languages. I'm sure there are languages, and I suppose in the grand scheme of things, there are languages that are less poetic because they sound much harsher, maybe. But maybe the native speakers of that language don't think it's harsh at all. So it really depends on your own experience of languages and it's down to personal taste I think a lot of this but I really think it is something that's yeah that's because you know it's like when people say that something's musical or someone has a musical accent or something um it's our musical voice or something like that it's mm. it's a it's a compliment and also I suppose that language or accent or voice or whatever it is sounds pleasanter to that person than many other such languages or voices or whatever it is. So I'd say that's all it really is. You made a good point. I was trying to think of examples. I kind of, when I read it, I, I thought, is it? And then I started thinking, well, how? So the only thing that came to mind was if you want to say to someone, I love you, you actually can't just say, I love you. Gra is love. And you can't just say is gra lom hu or you know, you have to say I have love for you. Ta gra agum dit. Or you even have to go a step further and say mohyol hu. So you are my music or gra mohri hu. You are the love of my heart. So that's the only example that I could think of that it's not as straightforward as maybe in English or in any, you know, I'm not sure even in German, you know, I love you. Um, but even in German, you could say, ich habe dich lieb, so I have love for you again. So it's not terribly poetic and it's not the only language that you can't just straightforward say, I love you. Um, but that's that was the only one that I could really think of. Poetic or I suppose every language has different outlooks on the world. For example, direction is a big thing in our in Irish. You know, if you're coming from one place, going somewhere else, or if you're coming, if you're going from one place, going, you know, it all depends on where you are. If you're in the east, going west, or if you're in the west, going east, so on and so forth, it all changes. So you have a different outlook on the world than you might do in Eng- if you were speaking in English, as well as um, with feelings. Your feelings, you don't have feelings. You don't say... Um, or you, you are not, are, you aren't your feelings, i.e. I am happy, I am sad. You'd say ta ahas urum or ta brun or whatever urum. So they're on you. So if you'd class that as poetic, um, I suppose that's your own, that's your own, I don't know, it, it's all relevant um, to each person, isn't it? But for me, that would be a bit more, I wouldn't say poetic. I don't even know what I'd call it, to be honest. I'd call it a bit more it just has a different outlook and there's a different kind of um, view on the world in, in Irish, but that goes for every language. Um, the only one I could really solidly think of that it's not so straightforward is I love you, um, which is a common one that people want to learn. And then you're going to have to explain, well, you can't actually say that you have to 
put it around. But there's lovely, beautiful phrases that go for that. So if you want to think of it in that way, that there are poetic ways to express certain feelings or to say certain things, for example, time will tell is no sign I'm sure, which I really like, or, you know, things like that. Absolutely. But I don't think it's any more poetic than other languages. No, no, not at all. Maybe more than English. Um, but that's just my opinion. Well, it's it, careful my fashion. I, I think so. Yeah, that's about it. That was a good example there about the different types of ways of saying I love you and also the way you act into your feelings and mm. even how you possess something in Irish. You don't have it really. It's at you. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. There's loads of stuff like that. And I suppose there are different ways, even how it, you you wouldn't even say it's raining. It, it It's mm -hmm. or just even more ways to say raining. But uh, it's it's putting rain so there's lots of it's very descriptive Irish is I think it's it can be descriptive in a manner that's very difficult to translate English and that's very common in Irish now if, as you were saying Emma if 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 you were to if if you want to describe that as poetic or not that's a different story if that's mm -hmm. the right word for it or not I'm not sure either but um, I think that's what people mean as well so it's both in that sense of it being a compliment but also a word that people use to describe how often Irish uses almost idiomatic phrases to 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 um to express very basic concepts, which mm -hmm. I, English can do too, but um it is it is more more common in in Irish I think whereas. Um, so yeah, it's, it's more flowery, let's say, or something like that. Yeah, you could say that. Um, okay, into her fad. And what got a market as the question Shin Herbert? Um, our Shin Anish, uh, Kisht O Robert E. Seattle. Now, a question from Robert in Seattle. I'm a little confused. I have two apparent, uh, just get this up. Oh, yeah. I have learned two apparent variations of how to say hello or greet someone in Irish. Version one is pronounced like dear do it, and the other pronunciation sounds like dear good. Are they different dialects, or am I totally mistaken about the pronunciation? Literally, don't they both mean God's day? Marshin, good morning, that's the case, Robert. Care to cap into Emma? Um, yeah, so that's down to dialect, isn't it? So I would say diarit, diarit with a harder T. But I know, Siobhan, you would say diarit. Would you you say it for me? I won't tell you what you say. Diarit. <laughs> uh, so the the the, 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 D, the D is softer um, in in D. But uh, so the oh, order are different, definitely many different ways to pronounce this particular phrase. Now the first example there, I think the dear do it. That sort of sounds to me, if I'm pronouncing it correctly from how you spelled it, it sounds a bit like something that maybe someone who isn't familiar with the Irish language might pronounce it like to do it. People say D U Y T and think U is an oo sound, do it instead of dit or dit or whatever way you want to pronounce it. I, I think that doesn't ring too well, uh, to, for, in my opinion. But the second one, do you agree? To, I, that that sounds grand to me. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. you know, it it sounds very similar. It's from that spelling you have. It's similar enough to how many people would pronounce it. Um, so do you? Do you? There's a, again, there's a few subtle differences, but do you? Do it. That doesn't sound right to me. Um, uh, yeah. I say, yeah, say the 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 Gia, yeah, the Gia and the, the Dia. So in the first one there, hmm. Dia, I would I would do more of a harder D, as I said, Dia. Now, D-U-I-T is how you would spell Dut. Um, but a lot of people would deny that. They'd say Rich, or that's where you're getting your G-W. You technically can say Dut, Dia Dut. Um more often than not, you'll hear it united, even though it's not always spelt that way. It's because it's God to you. So it's technically there in the accusative case. Um, but the accusative isn't so, you know, important, not important. But, you know, there's not so many changes in Irish. Um, but one of them would be that the, the H goes in there. Dia, so dia, dia, dit, 
dia rit or dia rit with a more ch and a j sound, but um, we're closer to the second one, I'd say. Yeah. Like, yeah, the mix between them. Um, good though. Okay, well, that, that clears that one up. Um, on Heed Hesht Ella on Son is from George in South Africa. So, what is the correct interpretation of Mohushla Mohri? And when is it used in a conversation? So, Siobhan, what do you to? Martin, um, so, Mohushla Mohri literally means pulse of my heart, or even more literally, my pulse of my heart. Um, it's an endearment, which is similar in meaning to to someone uh, to calling someone the love of your life, um, or my or something similar, my dearest love, or something like that. Because when you think of it, someone has to be really, really important to you to call them the pulse of your heart, the the the, the very sort of your lifeblood sort of thing. Um, it's so obviously there has to be a very they have to be really really important to you they, they keep the blood flowing in, in your they keep your heart beating basically so that's I think it's a wonderful um, endearment and interestingly it's an endearment that has been a bit anglicised you'll find it in some um, English language songs in Ireland and you might hear it pronounced there as Makushla uh, Mahushla would be the Irish pronunciation, but you can find it as Makushla can be spelled different ways. I think it's M A K U S H L A or something like that. And you can see that in older songs because I guess people just kept it has such a strong meaning, deep meaning, that it people just kept saying it. And um, so Mahushla is simply my pulse. Again, even without the Makri part my heart, even without mentioning my heart, that is a very deep meaning, of course. Um, so when it comes to when you would use it, as I said, an endearment, it's really, you're really only going to use that for very specific people. Um, you'd use it as you would use the phrase, the love of my life. Usually I'd say mostly you'd, um, you'd say this to the person, I would say, more than anything else. Um, so it's uh, that's that, so it's a, it's a lovely lovely phrase and you'll often hear it in songs as well and um, that's another common usage of but in 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 conversation it's going to be as an endearment in who would me get her name neil perfectly explained Sean. for me to get in the martian and heed kishtela so um, let's have our next question. Um, so our next question here is from Robin in County Cork, Kunde Corky. Why do we sometimes say Jimmy and at other times just Imi or Dimig and Imig? Is this a rule that applies to other verbs at other times? What is the rule? What does the prefix the apostrophe mean? Thank you. Ankhist or Fad Robin, Ankhist, Kurumila Mahagat. Marcin, here the Kefin to Machinema. Yeah, so Robin, Gurmila Mahagat. So you said Imig there, right? So Imig is the stem or the base form, what you want to call it, of the verb to go. Uh, the dictionary form, if you look up go, you'll see Imig. It's also the imperative form. So if you're telling someone to go, giving them an order, uh, you would just say to them imig or even imiglat, which was uh, would be off with you or you know go off with you. So basically go or go go away even. Um, and then when you see dimig, that d apostrophe is added onto the front, and that is indicative of the past tense. So putting verbs into the past tense, regular verbs that is, uh, in Irish is quite simple. It's it's a simple. Um, idea. You have the base form or the stem or whatever you want to call it of the verb or the imperative and with normal regular verbs be beginning with a consonant all you have to do is lenite them at a shavu. So um, B goes to V to B yeah? or um, C to sit would be HIG so or HI um, with a shavu on it. So that's the idea. Now, you can't actually put a shavu or a lenite, a, 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 a vowel. So when you're trying to put a verb 
beginning with a vowel into the past tense, you have to do something different with them. Um, so for consonants, you add a shavu, but with a verb such as imik or imer, which is to play, or i, which is to eat, they all begin with vowels. Um, you can't unite them, so you instead add a d apostrophe. So imer, to play, changes to dimmer. Uh, I, meaning eat, changes to di. So you add that D apostrophe. Now, where that comes from, it is do, D-O, so the imig or the I. Um, historically, you can still, in Munster especially, it's still added in front of all, a lot of um, even words beginning with consonants to in, indicate the past tense. Um, but quite simply, the imig, you never want to, well, you try and avoid in Irish two vowels coming together. So it apost you get an apostrophe there that fills in for the O there. So the imig, you have two kind of stops there, the imig, that you kind of, we like to avoid it in Irish. We like to flow off our tongues a bit quicker. So it, it's much nicer and easier to say the imig and the instead of the i or the immer or whatever it might be, yeah. So that would be my um, my explanation. Siobhan, do you have anything that I missed out on? Or on crushing, that was a great um, description there of how it works. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it, that's it. And there are so many examples, like uskal open, duskal opened. Mm -hmm. How would you really know? Well, I guess you could kind of tell from context, but there's good reason. And as you said, there's historical reason as well that still survives in um in in some of the Munster dialects, like you'd hear of de V instead mm -hmm. of simply, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's Cork Irish, isn't it? You'd hear that more so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's simple enough when you get your head around it, kind of, and get used to it. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's the case. I'm going to go to the next one. Um, so the next question is from James, James in Orlando, Florida. In this case, I'm not sure which to use, eclipses or or lenition shavu, or possibly just leave it alone. So in er the car, car or gore, the bird is on your care or a bird is on your care. My inclination is to use an eclipses because of the transition from do to car. Marshin, get uh, to same. Well, on kish, and this is something, James, that a lot of people ask um, when learning Irish. Now, unfortunately, your inclination, just because of a transition, there's a rule. There's a rule that's quite easy to learn. And I'm going to tell you the rule for consonants. Now, there's a different rule for consonants and vowels, but we won't, we don't have time to get into it all. But it's quite a simple one. And I explain it. There's a couple of different ways you can you can explain it, but I'll I'll tell you. So you have your possession. So mo do a a or vor a. So my, your, his, her, our, year, or your, you plural, and there. So with Consonant, so car, we we'll use car or even cat, which is a cat, a car is a car. Motto and at, so the first three, mine, yours, your, and his, all get a shavu. So it'll be mochor, dochor, achor. Okay. And then you have a. So you've actually, you can see there up on the screen, you've a, an, a, you have three as. So the first one with a lenition following it in a consonant, that would be his, so his, his car, achor. Her car, it can't be achor because that's his car. So something has to happen that, and nothing happens. So it's a car, a car. So a car, a car. And then the last three, or, vor, and a. So our, year, and there, so all of the plurals, first, second, and third plural, they all get eclipses or, or rules. So it'd be or gore, vor gore, and a gore. So if you see in a sentence a gore, and you've no other context, well, you know, judging from the rule, that if it's a plus an uru, then it's going to be there, it's plural. So that gives you an, an idea of what who you're talking about. Because when you've three of the same pronouns, something has to happen between them all so you can tell the difference. So how I like to explain it to people is I draw little stairs. Now I would do it, but I don't have time. You draw little stairs. Okay, so you do three steps up and you put mod a. And at the top of the stairs, you put a 
for her. And then going down the other side of the stairs, you do or, vor, and a. And then I put a little arrow going up the first three steps, so modo a, and I put a shevu or a h underneath it. Up at the top, I put a line for nothing. She gets nothing in the consonant world. And then on the way down, I put another arrow facing going down the way, following the three last or, vor, and a, and I put an uru. So that kind of solidifies, you know, how to do it. Now, I actually was doing this with some of my own students uh, last week and someone asked me, will it ever become natural? Will we ever remember that to say, you know, to add, a, add an eclipse or add a shavu? It does, but it takes practice and reading. So, you know, if you pick out five or ten words that uh, begin in a consonant that can be lenited um, and practice those, um my my your his her mix it around for yourself and do kind of little sentence drills like that it'll become more and more understand you know common to remember and you'll be like oh no i i have to think about that blah blah blah, blah. so practice makes perfect with that it's something you just actually i just have to sit down and learn your then you'll have a gut feeling eventually when the when the rules are in your head your gut feeling will come back in you're saying mm, that doesn't look right so mugor Right now, it might be your gut instinct, but sit down and learn those rules that are on the on the um, screen now and come back to us in six months or six weeks, however, when, however long it might take you and see how your gut feeling might change there. So that's the explanation. There is a rule. There is a system. It might not be the easiest thing to remember at the start for some people, others it might, um, but that's that's the how it goes for consonants. Now, if you want with vowels, you can, that's a question for another day, but um, it's not so different or difficult either. It just changes a little bit. So, yeah, Shinmo explanation. Siobhan on Vlain or Dela, a good in Kurdish. Oh, Neil, the Kurdish San Wahe, that was a brilliant uh, explanation there. And sure, we should put that. Um, that stairs you have, um, we should put that, uh, a model of that in the blog post, yeah. which is linked below in the description box. Of course, we'll add the notes, um, hopefully tonight to this um to that blog post so check in later on tonight or tomorrow and uh, they should be there um martin on what in the fad so there are all the questions that were sent in to us good or meal or fad maybe we could have a quick look at some of the questions in the live chat because good or maki or fad us the shoe so thanks to everyone who who's there in the in the live sh chat it's great to see it's so active and everyone just chatting together and, and everything's brilliant um so let's see if there was um one there uh so let's see um in little, oh yeah there's a question here how many hours a week do kids learn Irish in English language schools? Is it taught in the same fashion as, example, French? I ex I assume Irish language schools lessons are all in Irish. Got a market. Um. So, care to keep into Emma? Yeah, good question. So for your assumption on Irish language schools, yes, all like, all lessons would be in Irish um except english class um my primary schooling for example was all was through irish and we did everything maths everything um ask uh, i went to an english speaking secondary school so i can speak on that we had irish i think every day if not four maybe four days a week i don't know if it was five days a week it's a while now um but yes, it would be taught the same um, hourly wise or, you know, as as German or French <clears throat> 45 minute classes are the usual one or and 50, 50 minute classes. Um, so, yeah, four to five times a week in an English um, language secondary school, primary school. I presume it would be every day again, um, if maybe four days. I think it might also depend on the school. Um, if there are any uh, primary or secondary school Irish teachers in the chat, you can comment now or comment afterwards and help us out. Siobhan, how do you happen to us? This thing, I definitely, as I said there, in Irish language schools, the lessons are in Irish. Though there can sometimes be the odd exception, sometimes they're really, really stuck and it can't get a teacher um, to do a specific thing, but that's really just an exception, generally speaking. 
they're all going to be in Irish. Um, when it comes to primary schools, um, I'd say, yeah, the, the thing is, though, often, even though they might be just with the primary schools, you would have, I'd say, they have Irish every day, all right, and at least one 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 class. And mm -hmm. um, also often they'd, they'd incorporate the Irish language into other lessons a bit. Again, mm -hmm. I'd imagine this depends on the school and on the teacher, but it seems to be, as far as I understand, it's a wide, widely enough used thing. I'm not too sure if that's increased or decreased over the years. As far as I know, they've stopped doing ro roll call in, in Irish, which used to be a thing. I, I don't know. Apparently, mm. they've stopped doing that. I think uh, I've heard that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that was just one school. I don't mm. know. But um, like generally speaking, a roll call would have been done in Irish. So there was lots of elements that were done um mm -hmm. uh, in in irish as well morning, morning prayer would often have been done in irish and i'm not sure if every school does morning prayer anymore and um they would have been done in irish as far as i know as well singing and extra reading and things like that mm -hmm. would have been incorporated in um Oscoelia in english language schools but i went to an all irish speaking primary school so i'm not too sure myself but yeah that would be when it comes to the curriculum though it's very different from how uh, foreign languages are taught it's not the same sort of curriculum it's a specific curriculum it's like the mm -hmm. English language curriculum is very different from how foreign languages are taught in Ireland as well mm -hmm. um, but also the Irish one it's 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 unique as well mm -hmm. to, to how it's um to, to how the language is, is taught um which kish to one Ella perhaps we'll do one more question then uh, I'm going to to see in Um, let me have a look there. My computer is slowing now. Well, Lily up the top there um, asked, can you two speak fluently? Um, can you speak Irish fluently? Yes, we can. Uh, we're very lucky um, that we can speak it fluently. So um, Siobhan offers her weekly uh, live chat uh, with our GROW members, Bite Size Bio, and all of the members there can ask Siobhan whatever question they so wish. And um, Siobhan, I would say I'm not always there, but the times I was there, uh, you answered everything. So, yeah, absolutely. Oh, Shine. Of course, we don't exactly. Obviously, we can't. Sometimes people ask, why isn't this in Irish? Why isn't that in Irish? Because, well, I don't think people would be asking us the questions if they were fluent Irish speakers. It, would, it wouldn't do much good if we just delivered lots of things completely in, in, in Irish, of course. So that's why you often hear us speak in English. But... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so of course when we have our 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 um our staff meetings, that sort of thing, they're conducted through Irish. The notes mm -hmm. are in Irish. That sort of thing. so we bite sizes run through Irish. You could say in in the background, behind the scenes, it's it's true Irish. So this would um, be the only time that myself and Siobhan would actually speak English to each other. Uh, would be live. We speak Irish every other. Uh, we email and contact each other through Irish um, as well with our founder Owen and Neil. Everything is Asko Ilke, So yeah. yeah. So like before this, with the before the the Q and A's, we'd often have a little chat a few minutes before we we start and at the end as well. And that'll be be in Irish. It'd be just a bit strange to speak in English together, I think. When and that's often the case. When when two people speak Irish and they know they're both fluent in Irish and they've spoken Irish to each other before, it just gets a bit strange speaking English to each other then because why? Yeah. <laughs> there's people yeah, there's Irish definitely in. people in the world that I've never I've spoken to for hours, but I've never spoken a word of English to them unless I forget the word in Irish or I'm not sure of it. <laughs> um and as you asked there Lily, we are fluent, but there's definitely words that I don't know. There's well in every language, you know it's a constant journey for me um, I didn't grow up in an all Irish speaking household but um, yeah I always there's always something new for me to learn um, vocabulary wise and even sometimes grammar wise so that's yeah. it and there's so many words that we'd use um, so commonly or you hear so commonly in English a bit like mm -hmm. the one there about um, glider and there was another seaplaning I think it was I'm like 
I don't, I don't know if I've actually said the word seaplaning in English before, um, before now. So it's yeah. just one of those words that you wouldn't use commonly. You might mm -hmm. have heard of it in English vaguely, and you may have heard of it in Irish maybe once. And so it's one of those things. So those more niche words, especially, they can be hard to sometimes one one word comes in. It, maybe you'd know the word in Irish, you wouldn't know it in English for those really niche words. Mm -hmm. um, depending on how you learned that word in the first place. So if you did like, let's say there's like a um, course, the there's those like courses, um, Ishka is the name of them. They're, um, I think they're all into like surfing and stuff and um, they, they do water sports through Irish in Mayo, mm -hmm. in the Mayo Gaeltacht. And for example, if you went there, you probably have all the terms in Irish. You mightn't actually have to. If I went there, I don't I don't know much at all about like water sports. So I'd probably come home with like all the terms in in in, in Irish, but having the notion what these same terms are in English. So it's mm -hmm. it's kind of that can happen. So it depends on experience and stuff. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there's plenty of people I know that they went to. Um, they did their exams and everything. They're leaving certificate exams through Irish science and biology now they know all of these words that we I would have learned in English for I don't know I suppose they could name every artery and you know all of that whereas I wouldn't know that because you know it hasn't come into my um life just yet but um yeah it's strange it's I like it it's it's a funny one I can only actually say my my times tables uh in Irish because I learned them through Irish so if I'm trying to think of anything again I'm not a math mathematician so I'm slow enough I can't say my for example my sevens are ones that I can so one by seven seven I couldn't tell you that too, too quickly in English but I can rattle them off in, in Irish so there's strange things that stick in your head as well when you learn it from um, a young age it's I like it it's funny uh, it's for it's I suppose we'll have to say to, to, to say our goodbyes given um given the time. Uh Ach An Kishtan or Fad Gurumila Mahagi. Um Gurumila Mahagi or Fad Agas Lauroi Mud Liv Galurish and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for all the great questions. Gurumila Magh Slan. Slan Gafol, Slan Tamil.